and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I will present as my contribution to the uh, space quartet of talks uh, some independent research designed by Dr. Amadeep Dugar of Lighting Research and Design. Uh, and he principally wrote this talk, which is on optimum lighting for plant walls. Uh, Peter Raynham from UCL and David Gilby from NDY Light worked shoulder to shoulder with Amadeep and other contributors I'll mention along the way. So what I'll go through is the background, why plant rules, why, uh, why are we doing this research, methods, what are we doing, how was the research carried out, results and conclusions, and then uh, a minute or two on learnings. So the background, what set us off on this course uh, nine months or so ago. Um, plant walls, I would uh, split the benefits of them between physical health benefits and physiological health benefits. Uh, sorry, psychological health benefits. So the uh, physical is um, uh, um, talking about air quality and uh, as part of the process of photosynthesis, uh, our plant walls clean the air of um, volatile organic compounds like formaldehyde and, and, and benzene. And uh, if there's too many such particles in the air, they can cause headaches, eye and throat irritation, breathing difficulties. Uh, regrettably, very um, topical at the uh, at the moment. And the secondly, the second point, uh, the mind, the uh, psychological benefits. This is connected to, let's say, humanity's uh, need to be around uh, life and nature. And biophilic design is a way of bridging this gap between workplace environments and, and, and nature by bringing in natural materials, uh, water features, uh, uh, plenty of natural light, uh, and interior plantings. And in terms of the uh, well rating, plant walls can help with um, uh, three of the seven foundations, air and mind I've dealt with, but also comfort as um, plant walls can act as acoustic panels. So what are the needs of plant walls? Um, I'm not going to go into optimum irrigation or humidity or temperature. I, I couldn't if I tried to be quite candid. But uh, I would say in a nutshell, plants, uh, they didn't evolve in buildings. They evolved externally and um, they require similar conditions that match their original native environments. And a critical one, of course, is light both the uh, quality and the, the, the quantity, because plants also have circadian cycles and uh, need day dark uh, um, uh, periods, they need sleep. So what is the optimum light? Now we've focused in on the light itself, and uh, this actually was the research question, because of course it can be answered from, from two two angles, the biological, what does the uh, plant want, and the visually effective, so for the people experiencing the, the plant walls, and they don't necessarily have the, the same answer. The biologically effective concerns plant growth, which you want to be stable. You don't want to be forever pruning the plant walls, as you see in this uh, picture. But uh, conversely, you don't want to be forever collecting uh, falling leaves or uh, worse, replacing the plant wall every uh, year or two. And then the visually effective, this is the people concerned that the plant walls look their best, natural and inviting. There's no point to have a perfectly healthy plant wall if the leaves look uh, unnatural. So fundamentals, here's the process of photosynthesis. Plants uh, need to grow food, unlike animals, they make their own by this process of uh, photosynthesis. And if I look at the equation, or the word equation anyway, they take uh, carbon dioxide from the air, uh, water from the ground, and uh, energy is provided from the, uh, from the sun, which is um, absorbed by, by 
filled plant, and this produces uh, sugars, glucose, and oxygen as, uh, as a byproduct. This is, in fact, what plants have evolved to do. It's why uh, it's why leaves are, uh, are green. They're green because they contain lots of chlorophyll, which, as I just mentioned, absorbs the sunlight. They have a large area to maximize the amount of uh, sunlight they can absorb. They're thin, so this allows easy diffusion of the gases in and out of the leaf, and they have the veins that you can see in this uh, picture to allow the transport of water and, and glucose. So what is the photosynthetic active spectrum to optimize this process? Well, as you can see from the spectral power distribution, there's some um, that the, uh, uh, the blue light and the red light is important. The blue light is directly related to the, the chlorophyll production, which I've just been talking about. And the red light is uh, responsible for making plants um, uh, flower and uh, 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 early growth, uh, seed germination, root growth, bulb development, etc. And you can see that this is related to commercial horticulture. If you want uh, uh, fast growth, uh, uh, a heavy density of branches, bigger leaves, etc. But if you're considering already grown plant walls, more important, isn't it, that they stay stable and the appearance of these walls are, are natural and inviting. And in this case, you need more of a complete spectrum than you than you see here. I mean, this doesn't look very natural, does it? So if I now move from the uh, active spectrum to the complete absorptive uh, spectrum, this comes on to another point. The photosynthesis is, is, is not the only light energized, uh, let's say, physiological process. There's others. For example, photomorphogenesis, which is, uh, concerns leaf formation. And if you look at all these different uh, um, let's say photosensitive uh, uh, pigments for the different processes, these are the type of uh, curves you end up with if you add uh, beta carotene, this sort of thing, as well as the, the chlorophylls. And um, uh, uh, if you take, let's say, the aggregate of all these uh, uh, responsivity curves, you end up with this sort of thing. So from literature, the, the two Absorption uh, spectrums most referred to are McCree from 72 and uh, Inada from, from 76. And not by coincidence, remember what I said about uh, plant evolution, they look uh, rather like uh, a daylight. So our original hypothesis was that a balanced spectral power distribution close to daylight would be optimum both for the plants and for the people. So um, having uh, set the scene, how was the experiment uh, designed around this? Well, <clears throat> as you can see, here's three identical freestanding plant walls. Each was 2.1 meters high, 1.8 meter in width, and they were put up at um, University College London at their Here East uh, uh, campus um, uh, near Hackney. And notice there's no incoming. In daylight, it, uh, uh, the, the, the only source of light was from the um, uh, experimental uh, uh, lights. So these walls were there for uh, five months. Actually, they're still there. There's more research being carried out on them. This, this is horticultural experimentation now. Well, actually, if they're not by now three heaps of compost because of the uh, coronavirus, uh, the place is in lockdown. So the plant walls, which were donated by another partner called Wonderwall from, uh, from Manchester, um, consisted of uh, 13 rows of these uh, uh, irrigated potholders, I, I guess you would call them, and they, they clicked uh, uh, together. And at the bottom, you see a, uh, a water storage tank with a pump. So the, the the water was fed up to the top level of pots and then would drip down to the uh, layers below. And we would only have to fill the tank uh, once a week or so. It's a pretty ingenious uh, uh, system. 
In terms of the uh, plants used themselves, there's nothing, um, uh, no intricate thinking went into this. Uh, simply, uh, we talked to Wonderwall and said, uh, please uh, select your top half a dozen best selling uh, um, plants. There's no point in carrying out research into something exotic, which is uh, rarely used. The environment of the room was uh, monitored every uh, uh, five minutes. The temperature and the relative humidity was taken, and you can see that the average is 21 degrees C, and 71% uh, relative humidity was certainly um, typical for most, uh, most offices. Then we come to the lighting. So uh, uh, the consisted of 18 dimmable track mounted uh, uh, spotlights from Alpha LED, Lumen Pulse Alpha LED, another uh, uh, partner into this research, each with wide beam, uh, I think 60 degree specular reflectors. So you had a very smooth and even distribution across the, uh, the plant walls. Each plant wall had uh, two uh, uh, test sources uh, of the three different types. Uh, um, so that's six and three tracks, that's 18 different spotlights. So for the five months, each wall was lit with a different spectral power distribution. And this was only changed during a few hours when there were visual assessments. And then all three plant walls were lit with one spectral power distribution, then all three plant walls next, uh, uh, lit with the next light type, and then all three plant walls lit with the final light type. Also, a clock timer was used to switch the lighting off and on. So it was 12 hours on, uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., then uh, 12 hours uh, off. The three uh, spectral power distributions, I, because of circumstances, had to take the photo from my home. I, <laughs> I don't have plant walls in my home. So we started with uh, 4,000 uh, uh, Kelvin as is typical for uh, uh, most offices. And then the second one was uh, uh, a warmer one, the, the, the 3000 Kelvin, also sometimes used in offices, but, but I mean, there's also plant walls in hotel foyers or shopping centers, etc. And then the third spectral power distribution, less often, I guess, used in offices, but it fitted the application area sorry, the, the, um, it fitted the uh, hypothesis to try a daylight source. And it does fit with um, uh, uh, circadian aware office lighting and, uh, and this trend, which I mentioned in my first uh, uh, Light Bites uh, talk. And then so delving a bit deeper into the three spectral power distributions, you can see that as the color temperature increases, then you get more uh, light, uh, more irradiance in the uh, short wavelengths. And uh, as it gets warmer, you get far more in the red. So if you take the daylight, the highest here, and the lowest at the red end of the wavelength, um, uh, red end of the spectrum. I wanted one variable only in terms of CCT. So the uh, CRI was uh, uh, the same, uh, same high CRI uh, throughout. And then if you consider the biological um, uh, side, plants need uh, photons for growth. And um, an indication of that is given in these figures, the, the micromoles per, per kilo lumen. So the relative uh, uh, photon output. Uh, these, of course, will be slightly higher for the warmer sources as more photons from red light and blue. But of course, the actual photons absorbed will depend on the plant ab absorption curves that I showed you, the Inada and the uh, McGree. And here is the average uh, uh, luminance, um, which you see was uh, 1,100 lux. The literature uh, uh, suggests that uh, higher illumination levels are necessary, five or even 10,000 uh, uh, lux. But the outcome of this experiment certainly didn't uh, support these high uh, um, lux levels. Uh, now I go on to how the assessments were made. Uh, first, the biological. Um, I was interested in very 
practical, a very practical assessment. So each plant was observed to find out whether it had perfectly healthy leaves, or at least 90% of them were, as you see in the top picture. Then it was given a score of four, or if it had no healthy leaves, i.e. it's dead, then uh, it was given a score of zero, and then in between one, two, and uh, three. And in a similar practical way, um, stem elongation was uh, recessed visually. So long stems, which were spindly and drooping, uh, were given the lowest score, uh, one. And the shorter stems, shorter, fatter ones, uh, i.e. more like they were in their original condition, were given the highest score. So rather than pictures of individual plants, here's the overall before and after pictures of the walls. So after five months, and you see particularly with the 3000 Kelvin, look at this enormous growth. I would say that's bad, it's, uh, uh, unsightly. Visual assessments now after the biological and uh, here's uh, the numbers of the participants. So 106 participants, actually there were more, but these were, uh, who completed usable uh, uh, feedback forms, some forms we uh, rejected. So 106 uh, uh, participants, all of them um, somehow connected with lighting. So a mix of professionals, architects, landscape architects, lighting designers, or uh, uh, students who um, from UCL who are on lighting uh, uh, related uh, uh, courses. And what they did, what, how, what was a typical session? So the participants uh, would come in to one of the six sessions we held and were, were given refreshments and were generally introduced to the research, nothing specific. Uh, we didn't want to bias them in any way. Then in groups of uh, varying from one person to, to six or seven, uh, were taken into the test uh, room and one by one, they looked at the, um, the three plant walls with the three different uh, spectral power distributions in a randomized uh, uh, way. And in between each of the three scenes, there was uh, a period of darkness uh, for adaptation reasons for, for 15 seconds. And what did they uh, assess? Well, critically, this uh, bipolar uh, scale of uh, one to five, so unnatural one to natural five, and then uh, reverse notice, unappealing to, to appealing. Uh, and then after that, there were 10 pairs of opposed adjectives. Here they are uh, uh, disentangled, ugly, beautiful, interesting, boring, healthy, sick, and so on. <clears throat> and there was a space for the participants to add their own thoughts so a lexical analysis could be done uh, afterwards. So um, what, uh, what came out of the experiment? Uh, first of all, on plant health. So remember, identical conditions for five months. Of the six species, three did uh, very indeed. Uh, so this means controlled uh, uh, growth. And uh, two, A and E, did uh, 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 less well, but okay. And the growth of C was, uh, well, it was it dead. There was no growth, over and done. It, uh, uh, I think it could have been, so I come to some learnings, that often C was underneath A. So this grew and, and overshadowed it, uh, literally. Or it could have been, um, you know, we selected healthy types, but maybe it should have had some plant food or something, something like that. So five out of six good, but one um, uh, kaput. Now, <clears throat> results. The uh, in terms of uh, biological, uh, averaging the scores for biological effectiveness based on the leaf condition, you can see that the uh, 5,600 Kelvin daylight was ahead. And added to that, they um, had the uh, healthiest stems. Remember, in terms of uh, looking as they did in their pristine prime. So stem elongation was lowest for the 
5,600 Kelvin compared to the other two walls, as I've already mentioned, due to the uh, red content in the spectrum. Finally, we look at the voice of the people, and um, here we found uh, results not so conclusive as uh, voice of the plants. It seems that personal preference was very widespread, and, and choices were made upon uh, in that uh, in that way. Nevertheless, 4,000 Kelvin was uh, slightly uh, slightly ahead in terms of ugly or beautiful. Uh, looking at these adjectives, one surprising thing uh, came out for me, which is that resoundingly people, uh, participants, uh, use the word uh, beautiful for 3000 Kelvin. And I think it's because mankind has a natural propensity to red, and we should have thought of that, because one of the uh, plants, this one, had uh, red uh, veins in the leaves. I think... Uh, oh, Roger, I, I could have spotted that. So that's another uh, uh, learning. And finally, the lexical analysis confirms what uh, I've already been uh, saying. The 3000 Kelvin were most colorful and vibrant. And then the 4000 Kelvin, a, a higher score for healthiness uh, and, and lower score for uh, artificiality. So the results, uh, visual effectiveness, all three CCTs scored well. So 4,000 Kelvin was uh, was the favourite. And if I discuss them a little bit, so I'm now going beyond the hard results. 3,000 Kelvin. I suspect the, the the liking for this wasn't purely connected with the light reflected from the leaves, but also from the skin tones and. Uh, general surrounding warmth. But anyway, this CCT should not be used um, because of the stem elongation on the horticultural side. 4000 Kelvin was the most balanced spectrum, and judging by the, the, the high score for naturalness and the low score for artificiality in the lexical analysis, uh, uh, here is where participants felt the most tranquil, not really the right word, uh, content. And thirdly, the daylight, the 5,600 Kelvin, slightly lower score for naturalness, but the SPD is closest to, to daylight at noon. Uh, uh, so looking beyond plant walls only, this does seem uh, to make it interesting for, for offices. Again, think in terms of the industry trend to, to circadian lighting. For example, as I presented in the last light bites with the uh, arrow research. So overall uh, uh, conclusions, biologically, uh, biological effectiveness, the daylight was uh, better overall for plant health. Visual effectiveness, the 4000 Kelvin is better for naturalness and visual appeal. And if you take an extrapolation from this, uh, you could consider a 4000 Kelvin light source with less peak in the red wavelength. So if you look at my cursor, imagine this 4000 Kelvin, the high peak in the blue, but less where my cursor is now, or spread out the red uh, uh, irradiance. That would be uh, interesting to this picture. This is from the, um, uh, back to Alpha Lake. So this is their headquarters in Traffic Park. And Traffic Park, they've got a four meter plant wall. And they're gonna continue this research for the next year with uh, Dr. Amadeep uh, uh, Dugar. And they've linked this wall, as you see, 4,000 Kelvin in this third, 5,600 here. And here the blend that we were just talking about. Look at these ferns. Do you see here, it's uh, slightly warmer than, uh, than here lit purely with uh, daylight. So let's see what happens uh, to growth in a, a year's time. So finally, for the sake of completeness, let me draw together the three learnings from this uh, uh, experiment. Uh, ordering of plants per layer, some grew comparatively more than uh, the layer below, which were overshadowed. Secondly, the experiment concerned green plants. So even a modicum of color in the leaves can disproportionately sway the outcomes, especially with the human predilection for red. I think that's uh, what happened uh, with plant D. And uh, thirdly, generally hardy breeds were selected, but perhaps more initial research should have gone into um, 
uh, get uh, soil irrigation, nutrient needs. I think that's what did for uh, plant type C. Uh, with that, I'll hand back to Juliet.